we want to welcome everybody to the alumni speaker series and it's being brought to you by our alumni office and career services this is our first session but we have a volunteer speaker scheduled for uh, the last tuesday of every month at noon and the speakers are part of the cu alumni network who are going to share uh, experiences that they had on the campus beautiful and tell us a little bit about their career choices and we want to encourage everyone to listen carefully uh, and ask questions afterwards during the Q&A session. We'll have a, a few minutes for uh, some questions. And we also want to remind you that these discussions will be recorded and archived for future reference. So please excuse ahead of time any issues with uh, Zoom that might pop up. Uh, again, thank you for joining us. And I'll turn things over to Sarah Turner and our alumni office to introduce today's speaker. OK. Um, well, today's speaker we have with us is Brian Manning. Brian is a 1986 graduate of Concord um, who grew up in Princeton and his degree was in business administration. His first career choice was as an attorney, graduating from Washington and Lee University School of Law in 1989. He practiced for 15 years in North Carolina, focusing primarily on business and employment law. He decided on a career change and received his Master in Library Science from North Carolina Central University in 2006. He also has a master's degree in public administration from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. He was the deputy director of the Cumberland County Public Library and Information Center headquartered in Fayetteville, North Carolina, prior to becoming the regional library director for the Appomattox Regional Library System in 2016. Brian and his wife Donna, who is also a 1986 graduate of Concord, live in Prince George County. His interests outside of work are photography, music, art, and Tar Heel sports. He enjoys working with the community, and he has also served as president for the West Fayetteville Rotary Club and is the president-elect for the Rotary Club of Prince George County. While he was in Fayetteville, he worked closely with the Arts Council of Fayetteville Cumberland County faces in the Community Foundation and Action Pathways. In, he's the past chair of the Hopewell Downtown Partnership and works with the Lamb Center for Arts and Healing, the Hopewell Prince George Chamber of Commerce, and the Dinwiddie County Chamber of Comber Commerce. Excuse me. So we're very excited to have Brian with us today. With that, I will turn it over to you. I appreciate that. Um, to give you a little bit of background, as Sarah said, I grew up in Princeton, West Virginia, and I have a lifelong relationship with Concord. My um, father spent a semester there before he joined the Navy, but my mother worked for Concord for decades. Um, uh, if To the extent you hear the bells, her name is cast on one of those bells in the tower. Um, G. Manning was the um, uh, secretary to the president under both uh, numerous presidents. Her last job was with Jerry Beasley. So I spent a lot of time on the campus, beautiful growing up, and then uh, really only looked to Concord as my undergraduate. Uh, my topic today, though, is the value of variety. And uh, Phil said that uh, hopefully a number of seniors said we're going to join this. Um, for all the class uh, that joined this presentation, um, my goal is to encourage you to consider the electives as not being something you're made to take. Um, yes, I know as you watch TV, if you still watch commercial TV, there are the ads for all the other schools where you can focus on just your majors and not have to spend four years. But there is value in learning um, all the different areas you can get a taste of while at Concord because unfortunately the days uh, economy is the likelihood is you are going to change careers. Uh, my father's generation attitude was you went to a place, you got a job, you grew with the company, you got a gold watch and you retired. Uh, that ended in the 70s and died in the 80s. And uh, although I started practicing right out of law school, after 15 years in, I realized it was not for me. So three points I want to make about the value of variety is, first of all, as I said, whether you like it or not, you have to take these electives. And those electives give you an opportunity to get a taste of other experiences, other information that very well can influence your skill sets as you go forward. You think it won't, but um, just in practicing law, you have to know literature. 
You have to know how to do research. You have to know how to relate to that jury that you're facing or the judge and be able to express ideas in unique ways. Um, there is not a redundancy to every case. Uh, the other reason though you need electives is because of that potential for a career change. I came to Concord having um, worked a little bit with my um, parents' attorney, Odell Huffman. He had me as a legislative uh, assistant. Uh, I worked as a page when I was in eighth grade at the West Virginia Literature uh, Legislature. And I never really thought of a different career. And in law school, I actually really enjoyed law school because it was research, it was writing, it was everything I thought it was going to be. And then I graduated and my life became dictated by billable hours. Um, and it was not what I expected. And I came out working for a relatively large firm in the Raleigh-Durham area, and I got to watch it implode. It went from about 45 attorneys to six attorneys very quickly as partners bailed ship. And that's how I wound up in Fayetteville. And there I worked for a small law firm where I did a little bit of everything. But by the end of the career, I realized um, it no longer was what I was expecting. Uh, the entire practice of law has shifted. I know that um, Judge Abahassan and others are going to have a panel on practicing law. And I wonder if they'll address how it's changed in just in their lifetime. But a lot of what I thought I would be doing was being shifted to paralegals and the amount of work for lawyers, particularly in a small city like Fayetteville was drying up. And by the end, my clients were wanting to spend more time litigating and fighting than actually resolving issues. And put it bluntly, my wife was saying if I was going to keep coming home depressed, either she was going to go somewhere or I was going to have to do something else. And uh, my wife was a librarian and she recommended that I look at librarianship and it is a profession. And that's when I realized as my midlife crisis, I was going to switch careers. But my plan was to be an academic librarian, a special librarian, uh, work for a college or work for a law school. But an opening happened at the public library. And, and I'm sorry, I talk with my hands. So I'm trying to keep them out of the, the picture, but that's the way I am. Uh, and my background with all the varied experience I had and all the different training made the public library a good fit for me. And moving into administration as a deputy director, my electives and my experience of working with the public helped me. Um, I truly appreciated the change of demanding money for what I had to say to people actually seeking me out and wanting me to help them do research. But even within my career in the library, it's changed. Uh, I still know of very old school librarians who have the reference desk and are just waiting for that student or that adult to come and ask with that really important reference question. You all don't do that anymore. Um, the public now comes and wants help in doing research. They want us to do programming. And the electives you take in art, in science, in computer science, help you be ready to switch as your career changes. Uh, I mentioned my, I was a legal practice. Now you see legal Zoom as being advertised and people no longer go to lawyers. They call and they get it off the internet. My own library offers a database called Gale Legal Forms and people do their own work. Um, and in my career now, I help people find the forms and the documents they want. Um, doctors, the medical practice that you may experience, if that's your goal in life, has shifted from more and more technology and you need to be savvy about how to find information um, using electronic resources. Uh, accountants, much more heavy in technology and you need to have customer skills and how to do presentations of the audit report. Um, Accounting was not my favorite courses at, at Concord, but that was my career and that was the um, degree I was seeking. But I found much more enjoyment in doing the history classes and the speech and the communication classes. I looked at your catalog online and there are art classes that are available. Um, study of art, uh, there is still music there, there is opportunities within the school to broaden your horizons. I know that's a cliche, but 
that's what it is. You have an opportunity and then you can adapt all those skills to your job. So, so the three points I want to make is that, first of all, you have to take them whether you like them or not. So find ones that you truly like, ones that will help you grow, help you become more experienced. There is value in that liberal arts. Secondly, you need to take skills that will help you in your career. Uh, communication, if you're going to communicate to someone in accounting, as a doctor, as a lawyer, um, as a teacher, um, whatever field is there, there are courses that will benefit you. And lastly, it helps round you out and makes you not so stressed out at Concord, just focusing on, I've got to get a degree, I've got to get out of here, I've got to get a job. Um, there's value in using this time to grow as a person because you may not have that much opportunity when you get out. And the final point again I'll make is you're probably going to switch careers. I don't wish that on anyone, but someone is going to come out of this school, um, do what they thought they were going to do for five years, and then decide not to do it. I have... Um, classmates who went from being a school teacher to a lawyer to now he is a music minister at a very large Methodist church in Raleigh. I have a other friend who does is in part acting in stage production in Baltimore, but his career is at the um, community college in Baltimore County working with the disabled. Um, I know of people who um, have switched to being pharmacists after being teachers or being pharmacists and going back to being teachers. So use this opportunity to be prepared for that switch that probably is going to come. I'm not a big fan of the gig society, but I understand that that's also something that's very popular now and your electives can help you have that alternative side job um, while you're doing what else you want to be when you're a grown up. Now, I don't want to take too much time. I promised that I would be brief. Um, one of the things I learned from Ronald Berger, um, he was the um, speech professor, is I have seven minutes of your time. After seven minutes, you've all started thinking about what you want to get for groceries tonight or what you're going to have for dinner or uh, what might be on TV that's going to occupy your time afterwards. I want to allow enough time that um, I can answer any questions you might have, the reasons I made the decisions that I may not have answered, um, other points about my career that you may have questions. Um, so I will open up the floor. Um, I understand we want to wrap up by 15 till 1, um, so hopefully we can do it sooner and I won't occupy too much of your valuable time because I appreciate this opportunity, uh, but I don't want to deprive you of anything else that you have to do. Well, Brian, we really appreciate you coming and speaking with us. And I, I mean, I, I love some of the things that you, you talked about. One, one of the first questions that I had is uh, working in the library uh, industry and field, how many times have you been uh, mistaken for Stephen King? Because you have that whole, that, that look. I, I have been accused of being many things, but not Stephen King. <laughs> Um, no, uh, it has ebbed and flowed my look. Um, uh, what I do like is being recognized as a librarian. It is a profession. Um, when people ask me, what do I do for a living? I say librarian first and library director afterwards. Uh, but going back to this job, um, public relations is part of my job. Doing a budget is part of my job. Doing research when I help Customers is part of my job. Teaching people how to use computers is part of my job. All of those pieces go with from a small library like they have in Princeton all the way up to large library systems like in Philadelphia or New York. And if all I had was what I learned in library science, I wouldn't be able to do this job or even as a librarian. Um, it, it's truly interesting um, the different careers that come out of librarianship. Um, there are specialty libraries, there's humanity libraries, there's medical libraries, um, all of which which benefit from earlier undergraduate. And that goes also with legal practice or doctor's practice as well. Well, Brian, in today's career market, uh, what, what are some things that you think that uh, current students uh, here at Concord or, or anywhere 
what do you think that they should try to obtain as far as skills that will help them in their career? Because the, the entire jobs uh, market and everything is changing so fast that uh, I'm sure that there are some things that you see in a, as a pattern of uh, what students are, are looking for, what people come to, to ask you about. And mm -hmm. you know, what advice would you give to students uh, that are are trying to figure out what they want to do, what they want to be when they grow up, and what skills that they might need to, to concentrate on early in, on in their education and their career? The, the skills that you, you really need to concentrate on, whether you're a business um, uh, major or, or any other major, uh, first of all is communication and being able to be clear about what you want and who you are. And the other thing you need to have is an understanding of marketing a product, which is you. Um, I see um, on a regular basis as I hire um, letters addressed to the wrong person or saying that they're looking forward to applying for the job as alumni associate. And I don't hire that, but they've used the same letter for the same job, uh, just cookie cutter, trying to get it out there. And that's, I understand the ease of that, but it's also lazy. You need to adapt your letter, your resume, your presentation of who you are um, to the particular job that for which you're seeking. Um, what would be a great presentation to be a marketing director is not the same presentation you want to make to be the head of arts at some um, studio or whatever. So be alert to how to communicate about yourself. And above all else, be honest. Um, part of what drove me from the practice of law, and, and I readily admit this was a failure on my part, was I took the path of least resistance. I came out thinking I was going to work in insurance defense, and that was the department I was hired for in the larger firm, that partner left and I wound up in bankruptcy and collection. And I spent a good part of my time chasing people around the state of North Carolina for Mitsubishi credit, Ford Motor credit and Chrysler credit. And if that's not depressing, believe me, it is. Um, I enjoyed doing employment law, um, but that worked right up and I moved into um, doing other things that did not suit me. So if you're not happy doing what that job is, um, or you don't want that job, don't apply for it. Uh, so they, I know the job market probably will still be tight come May of 2021 for those graduating, but throwing a resume at the wall and seeing what stick is not going to make you happy. So be alert and also be flexible. Uh, maybe you thought you were going to come out and be a CPA for one of the top firms, but there may be a uh, accounting job within a corporation that would suit you just as well as you look at what's going on and what you want in your life. Uh, but those are the skill sets you really need is to be able to market yourself, be able to craft a resume and be willing to, uh, um, it's particularly easy now that um, we have desktop publishing. Unfortunately, in my day, you had to create one resume and you ran it off on bond paper and that was your resume no matter what you can adapt your resume every time you apply for a job to focus on the skill set that that particular employer will be looking for. And then keep that resume. I mean, I, I, I have no plans of going anywhere. This probably will be my terminus career because I like being here. Um, uh, in librarianship, like a lot of professions, to move up, you've got to be willing to move out. And so if I were to move to a director at another library, I'd have to go somewhere else. So. I'm happy here, but I still have my resume on my computer at home and I keep it up to date and I still get the job listings from wherever. So be prepared to be flexible and change. Brian, you said something about uh, your own career change. And, and for those of, of some of us who <laughs> have thrown their resume against the wall to see what sticks, what advice would you give them having look, looking back on your own, own career change and uh, mm -hmm. you know, things like that? What would you give, uh, what type of advice would you give to someone who is considering a career change 15, 20 years into their career? 
for someone, and, and that's actually kind of unusual nowadays. I do think that that's a, a, a of importance is to decide why you want that career change. I understand being unhappy in a job. Um, and I understand also working for a really bad boss. Um, I try not to be a really bad boss because I've had really bad bosses. Um, but just saying I've got to have a career change is not enough. It's realizing one, this is not fulfilling your life. And it may be, um, as with my practicing at the law, it was not what you thought you wanted, or it is consuming too much time when you have other things you want to do. Uh, for 15 years, I um, uh, lived to work. Now I work to live. Um, I have time for my family. I have time for a little bit of travel. We don't do much. I have time to think about what I'm going to do this weekend other than where I'm going to get to the work I need to get done before I get to Monday. I, I, I'm not saying to be lazy, but I am saying that you need to find enjoyment in that career. And there are people I know that do that. I know of, of attorneys and doctors who find fulfillment in that job. And if that's what you do, that's great. If it's not, then you need to decide, well, what do I want? Um, one of my attorney friends came out, worked with a large firm. Now he works with a nonprofit in Atlanta, making a lot less money, but that's what moves him to do that. That's what made him change that particular type of career. Um, the attorney that I know that now does uh, plays and staging in Baltimore, that's what he decided he wanted to do. Uh, one thing though, I will say, and, and it's the harshest comment um, I can make about changing careers. Uh, you need to be prepared to live within the income you're going to get from that change of career. Uh, when I started thinking of moving from legal practice to librarianship, and I thought I'd go into um, academic libraries, law libraries, uh, I went up and talked to the librarian at the um, Campbell University School of Law, Olivia Weeks. And her point blank statement up at the beginning was, you're never going to get rich doing this, but the people who come to see you want your help. They need your help and you provide them the assistance they need. And the thing that really I liked at that point was, and if they don't like the answer you give them, that's the answer. There's, <laughs> that, that's what's important is you provide them the correct information and that's the role of a librarian. And that's really motivated me to choose to, to switch my career more than in the direction I took it rather than anything else. Um, if you plan to be an artist, I wish you well. I hope you great success but don't plan to be rich right off the bat. And most expensive paintings are sold after somebody dies. But if that's what gives you your life meaning, then by all means, follow that course. Well, that's good advice. Uh, with everything going online and so many more colleges and universities using the online and virtual platform, what do you think about uh, the possibility of more law schools going online to a, a virtual mode? It's, it's an interesting thought, and this has driven um, the process further along. Um, particularly law school is, is, is the example you asked. It's mostly classwork um, in the initial years. And so online classwork is possible. Uh, I mentioned before, uh, we started this presentation to feel that my last degree was an online program through um, UNC Chapel Hill uh, Public Administration. And it involved doing group projects. And I had groups where one of my classmates was in California and another one was in Illinois and two of us were in North Carolina. And this particular format works well with collaboration. Uh, I don't know what platforms you're using at Concord, but uh, UNC encouraged us to use Google Documents because you could um, share, you could collaborate on a document, you could edit, you could comment, you could work together. All that's very easy, whereas in 1986 through and uh, 82 to 86, we had to meet in the library. We all had to bring our own versions. Someone had to finally agree to be the person to type it up. 
yes, I actually used the typewriter, uh, believe it or not, in Concord. I took a class that included how to fold an envelope or hold a, fold a letter so you could put it into an envelope correctly because that was important. Technology has made this kind of interaction so much easier. I think law schools will move more and more of their opportunities for classes online. Now, there are some things though that would not happen um, at a law school that would happen possibly in an accounting program. Um, practicals where you actually help people. Um, w &L, Washington Lee University had an internship program with the women's prison in Alderson and also with one of the mental health facilities in Stanton. And you would have to go visit with the client, go work on the paperwork. I think um, the last I heard, one of the professors I really liked had a um, project working with minors trying to qualify for black lung out of Beckley. That's one of those things that traditionally requires actually meeting with the client. And unfortunately, in a lot of situations, the access to broadband or access to telecommunication doesn't exist. But it would be very easy for an accountant to share documents, meet this way. You're experiencing it right now with teaching. Um, speech professors could easily share the screen and allow me to do a presentation like this and evaluate it as a group. Uh, I don't know what any of the other people in this um, presentation are doing right now or what anyone watching the recording. Someone is multitasking. They're checking their phone. They're checking their iPad. They're checking their email. I understand that. I accept that. But that's part of the modern life and you just to adapt to it. And I think with a lot of graduate programs, you're gonna see this more and more. You'll have to tell me how it's working with undergraduate classes. Yeah, one of the things that we ran into is uh, some of our freshmen seem to be a little more, uh, I guess, well-versed in using uh, the virtual model because they've had some experience with it in high school and especially this past uh, spring. And so they're, they're a little bit more comfortable uh, with using the Zoom platform. Uh, some of our students that are juniors and seniors seem to have expressed that it's a little bit uh, unsettling for them. But, but we're, everybody seems to be getting along through uh, everything pretty well. And, uh, right. so. and you, you get the break, and this is going to be showing my age, you get the Brady Bunch effect of us all in little squares and boxes. Um, and you miss that individual touch, that, that being in the same room, being able to look at someone in the eye, um, Zoom meetings I've attended as people have come and gone, they shift around and rotate around and it's kind of disconcerting, but eventually people can adapt to it. Um, I just miss talking with people in person. Um, there are a number of libraries in Virginia that still, because of the count, because of the um, infection rate, have not opened. And to the extent possible, I have open locations because I have so many people that depend on broadband um, to come into the library and use it. That's a big restriction for this type of programming, this type of education. Um, I, I worry about a number of the pockets of the communities I serve because they don't have broadband. They still depend on dial-up or satellite because cable has not ridden, uh, driven um, uh, fiber out that direction. And I assume that applies to a lot of the people in the Concord, Concord um, uh, situation. They just don't have access to high-speed internet. Yes, that absolutely is something that we ran into with a lot of our students in the more rural areas is the fact that they don't have access. And, and a lot of folks uh, noticed nowadays think that you know libraries are on their way out when in reality they could become an even uh, greater asset to the community because of the broadband access and having someone like you who can actually guide them to find the information that they need. So I think that libraries are, are as important as ever um, in that regard. Well the nice thing about libraries, one of the you know, they, like all professions, they have these kind of guidelines or rules or things of that nature. But one of the principles of librarianship is that the library is a living organism. We adapt. It's not about books or DVDs. It's not, it's about information. And so 
um, whatever format that information takes in the future will still be what libraries do. Right now, as we speak, well, pre-COVID-19, the goal was um, programming and in-person involvement because that's the way people learn. They didn't want a book. They wanted to have someone show them how to do it. And so librarians have to learn how to do that. Now we're having to learn to do this just like this presentation. The same applies to everyone that's a student at Concord, and which brings us back to the variety. Um, I have no idea what any of these careers um, that Concord has as majors are going to be like in 10 years. Technology is going to shift and change. Um, I don't see every job being automated, but a number of the jobs for which, uh, careers for which the students are training are gonna be completely different in, in 10 years, 15 years. And the students of Concord are, uh, and every university and college are going to have to be able to adapt as that changes. Um, as I came out of Concord in accounting and I did not pursue accounting, but the use of computers and online forms and things of that nature really didn't happen. You went into the accountant and somebody still typed up your tax forms. Now it's plug and play. You, you, you put in numbers. So what is really wanted from an accountant is advice and financial planning more than just be, being a bookkeeper and a tax consultant. So that career has changed. Um, I have uh, in-laws and two nieces that are school teachers and a sister-in-law who is in special ed and they're adapting on the fly as we speak, getting ready for the schools to reopen on September 8th. And it's still not clear to them how that's going to work. Um, so um, they're learning as they go. Um, it's just a changing world constantly. Um, what used to be consistent, you can't rely on anymore. I, I came to Concord from the public school system as a science teacher. And three or four times this past uh, year, I, I would get on my soapbox and talk about technology and tell my students in five or 10 years, most everything that has to do with public education will probably be online. And lo and behold, before we could finish the year, we were all online. So uh, it is, it's something that, that you have to adapt to and, and, it's, and it's changing all the time. Uh, I, I don't want to monopolize the time here. So does anybody else have a, a question or comment that they want to make? Well, Brian, I have a question. Um, just you know, thinking back about your college experience, is there something that um, maybe you know whether it was participation in an organization, an internship, you know, something that you're like, gosh, that really you know helped me, or I was really you know benefited from that, or maybe something that you look back and wish I would have wish I would have studied abroad, or something. You know, is there any kind of um, little tidbit maybe that you would, could share with the students kind of as, as they're trying to figure out not just you know classwork but maybe something okay. else um, that they could do while they're here. I don't know what opportunities are currently available but when I was at Concord there was an opportunity to um, study abroad. It was not for an entire semester but um, a Dr. Bell had some kind of friendship with a professor at the um, University of Reading just outside of London. And so one year students from Reading would come visit Concord and the next year we would go get a visit them. We got the better end of the deal. And so I took uh, a courses on Shakespeare and on um, medieval history. And that involved not only classes at Reading but also a trip to Wales to look at ca uh, castles. And also we saw Richard III at um, uh, this uh, Shakespearean uh, theater at Royal Shakespeare Theater. And it was wonderful. It was an opportunity, again, to experience things that I would not otherwise be able to experience. One thing um, in my own way I regret is I stayed at home. I commuted. Um, uh, part of the deal was what I saved in room and board, I got to use in buying a car. And at 18, that was much more important to me than the college experience. But I think that I would have gotten more. Donna, my wife, uh, lived on campus. And I think I would have gotten more of an experience living on campus. I, so I missed that opportunity. But I got a car, so you know, go with what you got. Um, but I also tried out and was in one play on campus because I enjoyed doing that. 
when I was at Concord, there weren't that many opportunities for work internships. You could get jobs here and there, but there really wasn't, except for student teachers, there wasn't the opportunity. And I think that that really does help if you get that work experience while you're still in school. So if you have that opportunity to pursue it, I mentioned that my law school had that in helping um, either at the prison or at the mental health facility, because you actually got to work with clients and see what that experience was. Um, I will say I know that there is cost involved at Concord that I didn't have. I, um, the state was willing to supplement the costs of an ed, uh, a college education more when I was there. I spent all of $263 for a full load as tuition and it had only gone up to $418 a semester when I left. And I know you pay a lot more now for your education. And so there's this massive desire to get your money's worth out of it. Um, my, my point is though, the money is, in, the worth is in the entire campus, not just in the particular class you're sitting in. Um, you will lose your mind if all you do is focus on your classes and don't, um, take an opportunity to see some of the other things that are on campus. Um, I worked for the school newspaper as a photographer and that was gave me an opportunity to be all over the campus at all time. And I truly enjoyed that time separate and apart from being on the class. Well, fortunately, the internships are something that we are uh, looking at and, and trying to establish some partnerships with uh, some local businesses and organizations to help provide students with internships because we, we think it's very important as well. Uh, if nobody else has any questions or anything, we want to thank uh, Brian for being with us today. And uh, your discussion was absolutely fascinating uh, as far as your experiences and the things that you have uh, worked with other folks on and uh, your law career and uh, change of career. So I really, truly appreciate you coming and, and being with us. Just I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. And, and I look forward to um, having an opportunity to look at the um, the library, you say, of other people speaking. And as okay. I said, tell Judge Evahasson that I wish him well. I, I, um, I think we were Boy Scouts together for years. So, okay. <laughs> so well, thank you so much for this opportunity. Yeah, thank you. And thank you to everybody else for uh, joining us today uh, in today's discussion and your participation. And next month's speaker will be Megan Parker, an O2 graduate, and she'll speak on engaging in a virtual environment. And that meeting will be held on September the 22nd at noon. And so we'll call that a wrap. And thank you very much for everybody being here. Thank you very much. You have a great day. You too. Thank, thank you.